So welcome to 1001 Nights of the Totality, um, a History and Class Consciousness Marathon. I'm Victor Strazeri. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University, Federal University of Sao Paulo and an associated researcher at the University of Bern. And together with uh, Mariana Teixeira, who will be addressing you soon in this introduction, um, I'll be hosting today's session, the first session of our six-part marathon on uh, Lukács' history and class consciousness. Now, I want to thank you for being here. Thank, thank all the participants. Thank HM for the possibility of doing this online marathon. And thank the audience for uh, if you're here live or if you're following up on our uh, marathon later. Thanks for, for participating. Um, this marathon is part of many, many events on the, centen on the centennial of history and class consciousness, uh, published in 1923. And the, the reason for all these events is the fact that this remains a compelling, a contested, and a globally relevant work. Uh, the way that the, the marathon wants to intervene in this uh, series of, of events and of, um, and of activities has two sources. So the idea for the marathon has two sources. One is imminent to the work and one is more connected to, to its reception. So the basic idea comes directly from something that Lukács himself states in the preface of 1922 to the work. Let me put that up for you right here. So, sorry about that. That's not the, there we go. Lukács says very, very clearly uh, that the reader, uh, so history and class consciousness is a collection of essays. And as such, the reader should not, this is Lukács speaking, uh, look to these essays for a complete scientific system of any kind. Uh, so these essays, some of them have been published before, some of them are new for history and class consciousness, I'll go to that. But basically, uh, they don't form a system, but they have a certain unity. So again, to go back to Lukács, despite this, despite this the lack of uh, the character of a complete scientific system, the book does have a definite unity. And this will be found in the sequence of the essays which for this reason are best read in the order they are uh, in that in which they are proposed. So let me just stop sharing that for a second. That's basically what we're trying to uh, decipher. Lukács is very brief in his preface of 1922, but he says that there's something in the order that tells us uh, something about the book as a whole. And so the marathon is going to involve uh, presentations on each essay, and not only that, but on both the prefaces to the book, the preface that Lukács wrote in, on Christmas 1922, came out with the first e edition, and the uh, famous preface that he wrote to a collection of his youthful writings, or writings from the 20s, in 1967. Uh, we start today with the, with the presentation on the preface of, uh, preface of 1922, and we end with the presentation on uh, the 1967 preface, and both will be given by Konstantin Behrens. Um, so besides that, in the middle, we will go through all the chapters in order and the reification essay, which is the longest, ha we have split in three, uh, also because it's by far the, the most discussed and uh, talked about. So if we go back to the slide, just a second. And to look at what Lukács himself says, let me share my screen again. And Lukács is very clear that it would be perhaps advisable for readers unversed in philosophy to put off the chapter on reification to the very end. And he, this is where the rationale for the marathon is uh, comes from, basically, that we do not follow his advice at all, right? Uh, History and class consciousness is mostly read, is read a lot and has, has been read in the last hundred years very intensively around the world, but it's usually read piecemeal or quoted piecemeal. And usually the chapter on reification is actually sometimes the only one that people read. So we don't follow Lukács' advice, just, to, just as we don't follow Marx's advice, I guess, with uh, 
avoiding the first chapter of Capital when we started, if we're not uh, philosophically well-versed, as Lukács put it. Uh, and the point here is not to follow Lukács' advice blindly, but to try to understand what he wanted to say with, uh, with this advice. And our experience in preparing this marathon, where we uh, had discussions about our impressions on the essays, is that really uh, reading the entire book and, putting, and looking for the connections between these essays really brings out um, a lot of insight, a, a lot of the message that Lukács wanted to, to transmit. Uh, what we also don't want, however, is to think of history and class consciousness as a unitary philosophical treatise uh, in the matter of Hegel's logic. So it's neither this fragmented collection of essays that you can read in any order um, in a disconnected manner, but it's also not, the, not, a, not a philosophical treatise. It's something that is uh, very much written from a, an intellectual that's in the middle of his development as a Marxist, as a revolutionary intellectual. Uh, the second aspect of the, that led to the marathon idea is the fact that this book is read globally by very different uh, audiences, let's say. People from the movement, uh, academics, and really in Latin America, Asia, uh, all over Europe. And this is reflected in all the events that came up. And so this is also, uh, we tried to reflect this the best, the best we could in the makeup of the marathon itself. So to reflect this really plural reception and the, then the multiple uh, perspectives that they result in, we have uh, participants from seven countries. Seven? Yeah. So we have participants from Brazil, Croatia, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, and the Netherlands. And from throughout the humanities and social sciences. So we have people from philosophy, social sciences, law, media studies, and literature. And going beyond that, we also have a, um, a, plur a plur plurality of Marxists uh, reading this, this book together. We have an expert on Luxembourg, we have a Trotskyist, we have Adorno scholars, people closer to the later Lukács and to the younger Lukács, uh, also someone with, a, with Althusser uh, in their past, at least. So the idea was to give you this variety of views, but at the same time to uh, give kind of a synthesis of this work. We already went through the, the marathon in, uh, in uh, live, basically, in Athens. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and we're invited to repeat it online. Um, so the way that it will work is we, we have six sessions. Um, each deals has at least it's two papers except for the session on reification, which has three. We will do it, so it's tonight, two sessions, tomorrow, Tuesday, two, and Thursday, we have the final two. At the end of each session, there's a Q&A. And the final session, the sixth one, is a general conversation on the book. We have the final chapter, uh, the final preface on 67, but a, a, a bit more time for the Q&A. So if you have any questions, any lingering uh, issues with history and class consciousness, in the Eventbrite page, you have the emails, uh, my email and Mariana's email. Uh, so you can send the questions there, or you can put it on the chat. And we'll do our best to, to reply or to give some insight into it. So just to finish, uh, this is a really rewarding thing to do. We, uh, the participants met basically over the last decade at HM in London and have been in dialogue ever since. Uh, we also, some of us met at a Budapest event on Lukacs in 2017. And then finally we uh, did the marathon this year in April and was, uh, was a lot of fun. We hope uh, this adds to uh, you know, your reading of, of history and class consciousness. Don't hesitate to send your questions. And now I'll, pa I'll send, uh, I'll open the floor to my co-host, uh, Mariana Teixeira, who will tell you also about uh, a publication that this initiative is tied to. So thanks very much and uh, have fun. Thank you, Victor. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to start by uh, also presenting myself. My name is Mariana Teixeira. Uh, I'm an assistant researcher in Lisbon, here in Portugal. I studied in Brazil and in Germany, and I've written a master thesis on uh, Lukács and the influence of Weber. 
uh, and my uh, area of research is critical theory. Uh, also, I'd like to start uh, by thanking historical materialism and Paul Reynolds for all the support in bringing this marathon that was uh, uh, happened in, in Athens earlier this year to this online format so that we can share uh, this event with more people. And uh, uh, I'd like, I'm going to moderate this first session uh, uh, about the first preface of 1922 presented by Constantine and then the first chapter on Mark Orthodox Marxism uh, with Alexandros. But before that, I just like to let you know that in connection with the centennial of uh, history and class consciousness, Victor and I are also organizing a special issue of the Brazilian journal Dissonancia. Let me share my screen so that you can also see. Uh, I, can you see it? I, I can see if you're, if you're, if you're, if you if you if you can see it, but anyway, um, so it's a special issue of this journal that is uh, uh, of the University of Campinas in Brazil, and we had an open call for submissions. Unfortunately, it's already closed, so we're in the phase of uh, finalizing the peer review process. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, uh, these short presentations that we are uh, doing. In, in this event. So we have a sort of guide to reading uh, history and class consciousness, uh, each chapter having its own dedicated uh, text. We also have some interviews uh, with Lukács specialists around the world. And it's looking quite great, uh, especially because we have contributions from many places. So we have so far contributions from Greece, Argentina, the UK, El Salvador, Australia, Cyprus, and Germany. So uh, it's looking very interesting with uh, also many different topics. Uh, uh, Lukács connection to political theory, uh, the, the compatibility between the young and the old Lukács. We have a, a book review of Tyrus Miller's uh, Lukács and Critical Theory published last year. So I just wanted to do this <laughs> advertising before we start. And now um, we will start the mar marathon properly uh, with Constantine Behrens, who's going to talk about the preface of 1922. Constantine Behrens uh, studied philosophy and liter literary studies at Potsdam University, and he's a member of the research training group historical relations between Judaism and labor movement uh, at the Moses Mendelssohn Center in Potsdam. His doctoral dissertation deals with Lukács' theoretical and philosophical historical investigation and critique of fascist ideology. Uh, he has published articles on Bartha Benjamin, Lukács, Karl Mannheim, and the writer Anna Segas. And uh, you have 20 minutes, Constantine. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Hello everyone, yes, thank you Mariana and Victor for organizing this online marathon and also to Paul Reynolds and everyone with um, historical materialism, of course. I'm glad that I, that I can be part of this and um, since there's not much time, I'm just going to start uh, reading my paper and there's going to be a lot of uh, quotations, but I'm only going to um, uh, explicitly indicate them uh, when I think it is useful for the audience. Um, so let's begin. Discussing the 1922 preface entails a discussion of the project, not necessarily the outcome of the collected edition of articles that is History and Class Consciousness or HCC. In the preface, Georg Lukacs wrote that he aimed at an Aufhebung, sublimation of concepts, which if they were conceived in a one-sided abstract manner would have to become, have to become false and were supposed to be brought to their true meaning less by a definition than by the methodical function they receive as sublimated moments within the totality. 
HCC does not appear to be a seamless product of the biographical period starting in December 1918, when Lukács joined the Hungarian Communist Party. The work seems to be encompassing reorientations after the suppression of the Hungarian Council Republic in August 1919, and events relevant to revolutionary history uh, like the Kaputsch of 1920 and the so-called March Action of 1921 in the Weimar Republic. In autumn 1919, Lukács had fled into exile in Vienna, where he remained, it, remained until the end of 1929. HCC consists of, a, of selected articles uh, dated between March 1919 and September 1922. And as Victor already said, some of them have been revised for publication, but two of them were new in this book. The articles are not arranged chronologi chronologically, but built on each other thematically. Yet, HCC can be seen as an unfinished programmatic project, as the true aim of this work, according to the preface, was to stimulate discussion and, as it were, to put the issue of dialectics in Hegel and Marx back on the agenda from the point of view of method. On the one hand, this allows for new questions to be linked to the collection of articles. On the other hand, in the first article, What is Orthodox Marxism?, the author warned against wanting to construe available theories as a sacred book, as he wrote, having a definitive answer ready to every new question posed to it. In the second article, The Marxism of Rosa Luxemburg, Lukács advocated the method of historical analysis of a given topic, aiming to situate each problem in its totality in order to reconstruct its problem history, to which one's own contribution factually and topically belongs. Sorry. Such a comprehensive situation, situa situating of the problems of HCC is of course impossible to achieve in this presentation. Instead, I will try to address tentatively two selected aspects. Lukács' use of the concepts totality and absolute spirit, taking into account his theoretical development preceding HCC. Lukács initially articulated his repugnance to the feudal bourgeois societies in which he lived until 1918 in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and German empire in pre-existentialist, life philosophical and aestheticist terms. With the outbreak of the First World War, his despair but also his criticism became more acute. During, the time, during this time, he established contact in Budapest with so-called radical leftists, such as Erwin Szabó, a syndicalist theorist of the left wing of Hungarian social democracy, translator of Marx and vice president of the Sociological Society, and also with the socialist politician Oskar Jassi. In May 1914, Lukács had married the former social revolutionary Jelena Krabenko from Kherson, who, when in Budapest in 1918, lived in the house of the Soviets. From 1910, he already maintained a friendship with the writer and former member of the German Social Democratic Party, Paul Ernst, now turned conservative dramatist, who in the 1890s had played a role on the side of the inner party opposition of the so-called Jungen or Berlin opposition in the discussions about Marxism and who had been a correspondence partner of Engels. Political involvement did not simply fall into Lukács' lap in 1918, like if a virgin had had a child. As early as 1914, Lukács wrote of a coming socialism. In his review of writings by Hans Staudinger, which examined, among other things, the cultural structural difference of the workers' world from the one of the bourgeoisie, he paid particular attention to a study on the psychology of the worker, written by Staudinger jointly with Fritz Seidel. In the reviewer's eyes, this research question was very interesting and promising according to its possibilities, but he deemed the study unsatisfying due to an inconsistent method used by Staudinger and Seidel insofar as it was based on rather anecdotal evidence for a present state of affairs among workers regarding their intellectual capacities for a normatively conceived culture. Lukács' plea for a sociology of culture was opposed to a philosophy of history in which the, quote, overall development of humanity is attempted to be traced back to one principle or several, quote, end of quote. At the same time, he advocated against a mere empir empirical historical immanence of science. 
Lukács by no means saw himself as a Marxist at this time, even though in his critical work, he occasionally showed interest in what Marx calls the problem of ideology. And he artic articulated his Hegel-inspired interest in the historicity of categories. His review on Benedetto Croce, written in 1915, addresses the latter's engagement with Hegel and Marx. For Lukács, Croce's founding of historical science from the concept of Hegelian spirit was problematic, as it tended to abolish the sharp distinction between objective and absolute spirit in order to arrive at a unified concept of spirit imminent in history. This entailed the danger of a positivist relativism towards historical values, as well as that of a panlogistic dogmatic metaphysics of historical progress, a merely affirmative attitude towards the actual development. Lukács endorsed an abstinence from value judgments in historical science, and at the same time showed interest in, quote, the problem of the historicity of the in itself timeless absolute spirit, end of quote. With regard to the question how it is possible that art, religion, and philosophy have a history at all, Lukács referred to a connection between changes in taste in art or new questions in historiography with sociologically conditioned interests. It was thus possible for Lukács to write in 1915, quote, the fact that historical materialism, the most important sociological method to date, has almost always become a metaphysics of the philosophy of history, must not make us forget the epoch-making value of the method on which it is based, only as yet not clearly brought out, end of quote. To him, the way to the solution of the problem lay precisely in what Marx calls the problem of ideology. Yet, somewhat contradictory to his own premises, Lukács, Lukács limited this to the objective spirit. For the value systems of absolute spirit, on the other hand, the problem would have to be formulated quite differently which he did not elaborate any further in this review article. As a consequence, in 1915, Lukács ultimately opposed everything that is to be understood as a product of social conditions with something he then still called the absolute. Lukács had published these reviews in Max Weber's Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik during the time of the Wehrdotelstreit. In context of his failing habilitation efforts with Weber, the Hungarian intellectual left Heidelberg in November 1917 for Budapest, where he participated again in the meetings of the Sunday Circle uh, he had co-founded in 1915. Some of its members, such as Bela Bolas, Bela Fogorashi, or Laszlo Rodwein, would later, like himself, become communists. At the same time, Lukács took part in the Sociological Society, where in spring 1918, answering to a lecture by Fogorashi, he opined, according to the minutes, that with a certain world vision, norms of action of different directions, and with a certain norm of action, different world visions can be linked without inner contradiction. In the course of its historical development, a given ethic could correlate with the most diverse epistemologies and metaphysics, without, for instance, affecting the political implications of this, eth of this ethic. An ethical idealism grounded in Kant and Fichte would have as its aim and content in relation to politics an ideal, namely the autonomous free will, seeking only the good as the sole possible definite aim. The validity of such an ideal could thus seem to be beyond history or be brought into relation with absolute spirit. Regarding actual politics, Lukács argued that in ethical idealism, the purpose was to create institutions that correspond as good as possible to the ethical ideal, and to elim eliminate such institutions that stand in the way of its realization. Concerning certain instances of obje objective spirit, Lukács gave his judgment that, quote, from the standpoint of ethical idealism, no institution from property to nation and state can have any value in itself, but only in so far as it conduces to the, high, the ethical higher development of the human being, end of quote. In this respect, Ethical idealism was supposed to be compatible with progressive politics understood in this ethical humanist sense. It seems conceivable that Lukács began to sympathize with socialism years before he joined the newly formed Communist Party, still quite suddenly and unexpectedly to his surroundings at the end of 1918, and eventually considered himself a Marxist. 
differentiating between objective and absolute spirit, he called for a transformation of the instances and institutions of the former in the sense of a will as a political ideal, which in turn did not initially appear to be further historicized, but apparently was to be justified in the sense of the latter. Two months after the anti-monarchist Asta revolution, in which bourgeois parties and social democrats came to government, in December 1918, Lukács joined the one existing party furthest to the left, less than one month after it had been founded. With the beginning of the Hungarian Council Republic in March 1919, when the Social Democratic and the Communist parties merged, he then became deputy and later acting People's Commissioner for Education. The ethical legitimation for his political stance should keep developing. In the booklet Tactics and Ethics, most of which was written before March 1919, Lukács already emphasized the determining role of concrete totality. The significance of its components was to be inferred from their functional position within the whole. While in the 1919 version of What is Orthodox Marxism, Lukács assumed that the development of society is de determined exclusively by forces present within that society and explicitly included spirit, namely art, religion, and philosophy. Here, referring to the theory of the Hegelian concrete concept, a certain overemphasis on an unconditional hegemony of the totality could still occur. Lukács supposed that the whole takes precedence over the parts without stressing the mediating instance of the particular between the individual and the general. Drawing on the pseudo quotation, so much the worth for the facts, attributed to Fichte, which is not reiterated in HCC, this Hegelian inspired uh, conceptual realism paradoxically led Lukács to a rather Fichtean notion of revolutionary subjectivity in his hypothesis of a sudden change or dialectischer Umschlag caused by historically conceived concepts as living realities. Decisions precede the facts, Lukács could proclaim, because he based the acknowledgement that concepts constitute an integral part of historical development on this rather Fichtean Hegelianism. Already before the beginning of the Council, Council Republic, he had written in the, uh, that the final goal, the classless society and the liberation from every form of economic dependence would be pursued by the proletariat's class consciousness as decisive factor of the homogeneous development of society. Becoming self-conscious in Marxism as if incarnating, quote, the self-discovery of the spirit seeking itself in the course of history, end of quote. Writing after the establishing of the Council Republic and the unification of the Social Democrat and Communist parties, regarding the unified will of the unified proletariat, Lukács presented the party towards the end of a social revolution as the executive organ of the will that is developing on the news, in the new society from new sources of, of strength. In 1923, on the other hand, Lukács would insist much more strongly on the historicity and inner contradictoriness of this totality as a dialectical historical process. This shift seems to be functionally connected to the changing use of the Hegelian vocabulary of absolute spirit, as rendered particularly clear by discrepancies between the two different versions of the change of function of historical materialism. While Lukács in 1919 introduced Hegel's terminological distinction between objective and absolute spirit with affirmative com commentary in order to develop it critically. In the more extensive version printed in HCC, the designation absolute spirit is explicitly, explicitly mentioned only once and immediately qualified restrictively in a new footnote. Altogether, there was to be no application whatsoever of the otherwise very problem problematic do doctrine of the spirit. And in, in accordance with this distancing, in the remainder of the article in HCC, Lukács exclusively used the term objective spirit and for that matter only in quotation marks. In 1919, Lukács had still harshly contrasted the purely scientific method of historical materialism with the latter as a means of struggle and had accordingly drawn a dividing line between purely social formations of objective spirit on the one hand and science, art, religion on the other. Even Hegel, according to Lukács in 1919, had merely outlined this important difference in principle programmatically, but had not consistently developed it. Marx takes over this unclarity unchanged from Hegel, Lukács wrote. The reason he gave for this 
was that in capitalism, absolute spirit, such as religion, had been reduced to the level of objective spirit, such as the institution of the church, which in turn supposedly showed itself to be quite directly socially, socioeconomically determined. For post-capitalist times, Lukács' messianic perspective was that economic life would become the simple function of the idea. With regard to class as a historical agent, whose psychological, empirical, and imputed class consciousness Lukács did not yet, yet distinguish in this passage, he assumed a necessary awakening of the proletariat, whereas, for example, individual scientific errors could only be corrected later after a successful revolution. In the rewritten form of, of the article in HCC, Lukács wanted the Hegelian terminology to be understood only in order to differentiate clearly between spheres. Spirit was a matter of the unity of consciousness and its object, which was close, Lukács explained, to Marx's way of addressing categories. Now, he conceded that the connections of those spheres that Hegel had assigned to absolute spirit are always given in a socially conditioned form, and at the same time insisted that they develop according to their own inner laws and preserve a much greater independence of their basis in the life of the society from which they necessarily spring. Judging by the ambition, a certain historical integration of the concept of absolute spirit had taken place. It had become part of a totality, not only encompassing uh, subjective and objective spirit, but also the spheres of religion, art, and crucially, philosophy and science. This totality had now become historical and thus contradictory within itself. A necessary, more protracted ideological work was now indicated when Lukács wrote more immediately of the necessity of awakening the class consciousness of the proletariat. The will of the proletariat, which has become conscious, was only defined negatively here, as to abolish itself and at the same time to abolish, uh, abolish the enslaving hold of the reified relations over the human being. Nevertheless, Lukács adhered to the concept of conscious action in which the conscious meaning of the every moment is seen as being one step ahead of the process. A comparison of the two versions of the article class consciousness likewise makes visible the efforts of historical integration. After the cup which had been ended by general strikes, which however would not lead to any further reaching consequences in the direction of socialism, in March 1920, Lukács already described the correct insight into the nature of society as perhaps the decisive, decisive weapon in general. In a critical situation, he wrote, only the conscious will of the proletariat can protect humanity from catastrophe. Yet, so far, the consciousness of the proletariat, understood here in rather psychological terms, had for the time being still succumbed to reification. Although Lukács attributed an important role to more general questions of culture, he still implied that their significance could only really be clarified after a revolution. In contrast, he showed confidence in a low threshold organization against reification and its consequences. Quote, the very existence of the workers' council to him was a sign that the class consciousness of the proletariat is in the process of overcoming the bourgeoisness of its ruling strata, end of quote. The workers' council as a form was seen as the political economic overcoming of capitalist reification. In HCC, almost three years later, Lukács emphasized that even after a theoretical insight into reification, the objectivity for a law-like necess necessity independent of the conscious will of existing human beings could in fact remain. Now, he explicitly argued against Kantians who conceive of history, quote, as in itself meaningless, meaningless material basis for the realization of timeless supra-historical ethical principles, end of quote. In contrast, any actually given false consciousness was supposed to be investigated concretely as a moment of historical totality. Using terms such as inconsciousness and repressed, which had not been used uh, before in the earlier version, Lukács now addressed contradictions between interests, actual behavior, and the manner of being conscious. And therefore both victories and defeats were conceived as a means of education. And the metaphor of the object lesson of history, which was being used here as well, this time was qualified to the effect that in its forms of, its, uh, of appearance, 
the overall movement necessarily exhibited no immediate unity. The Workers' Council was now depicted by Lukács as the organ of struggle of the entire proletariat growing into an organ of state. Its existence was devised to be constantly developing, which Lukács also understood as a struggle with oneself. At the same time, he referred to communist, uh, sorry, um, uh, um, I only need uh, three more minutes, maybe two. Um, at the same time, he referred to the communist party as the organized form of the correct view of the overall economic situation, and thus of the correct class consciousness of the proletariat. A programmatic division of labor between workers' councils and the party was at least implied here. His ambition of consistent historical integration, Lukács reformulated as follows, quote, Hegel's half-heartedness lies in the fact that he only allows the absolute spirit to actually make history in appearance, end of quote. By contrast, what mattered was to see the true bearer of historical movement in history itself and the way the proletariat organizes itself as a class and hence in the class consciousness of the proletariat. If the will of the working class is not to be imagined as something fixated, returning to its own or original harmony through history like absolute spirit, there's work to be done to elicit this will. Under the premise of a truly historical totality with no absolute spirit beyond it, and given that workers' councils cannot guarantee by their mere existence the nightmare of all dead generations to be already overcome, everything seems to depend on whether or not Lukács will sufficiently be able to conceive, of, uh, conceive a mediation of class consciousness and the will of the proletariat in a convincingly democratic manner. Certainly for Lukács, the indispensable, indispensable inner party ideological labor necessarily included criticisms directed to the party by its members, who at the same time were supposed to bring the whole of their personality into this organization in order to prevent rigidity, fossilization, and ossification, both from themselves and from the party. Lukács dated his preface, as has already been mentioned, and perhaps ironically, Christmas 1922. According to Christian tradition, this is the celebration of God becoming human through the Holy Spirit and a woman born without sin. According to Jewish tradition, so far the Messiah has not come. Obviously, Lukács expected the most important, the most important changes from the future. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you so much for this very rich presentation, not only of the preface, but also of these complicated theoretical movements that preceded it and led to history and class consciousness. Um, as Victor mentioned in the beginning, we'll do the debate after the two presentations. So feel free to put your questions in the chat on YouTube and um, we will have the discussion afterwards. So now, uh, we'll go to the first chapter of the book, What is Orthodox Marxism, with a presentation by Alexandros Minotakis, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University College Dublin. We also have between 20 and 25 minutes. Alexandros, thank you so much. Hi, thank you very much, and uh, many thanks to Historical Materialism, who made this whole uh, online marathon uh, possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, hope that everyone can, can see the, the PowerPoint presentation. As you mentioned, the, what is Orthodox Marxism is the first chapter in history and class consciousness. There are a lot of things going on in this relatively short chapter, so it's, I will try to, to build this to, to form a narrative in order to make this more uh, comprehensible. Some introductory remarks, and then we'll dive into the chapter synopsis, and then we will check out some of the criticisms that were expressed against this particular part of history and class consciousness, both in the 1920s and again in the 1970s. Uh, first of all, there's a sharp distinction between uh, the first chapter of history and class consciousness and earlier articles written by Lukács. Uh, I'm speaking more specifically about Bolshevism as a moral problem. Lukács has taken an abrupt turn he now doesn't want to criticize Bolsheviks and the Third International 
based on a moral on moral grounds, but wants to build a theoretical philosophical framework on what he considers to be orthodox Marxism. And most importantly, I think he wants to, to deepen the schism between the second and the third international. And I will emphasize this point later on. Of course, as this is the first chapter, there are several key concepts that are introduced here. And interestingly enough, uh, while Lukacs was a relentless critique of himself in the 1967 preface, and he, he wanted to, to be a harsh critic of many of the key points of uh, history of class consciousness. However, he said that one of the parts that I still stand by is the definition of Orthodox Marxism, which I offered at this particular uh, passage. We will also examine the passage later on. Okay. So these are the key concepts that I was referring to earlier. I'll try to build the narrative. Each one brings us to the next, meaning what is Orthodox Marxism? Brings us to the antithesis between Orthodox Marxism and the Marxism of the Second International and the bourgeois thought of his era, which brings us to the question of dialectical mediation, which brings us to the concept of dialectical relation between subject and object, which brings us to the notion of the totality, which appears for the first time uh, in this uh, particular chapter, and of the idea of proletariat as the identical subject-object of history. First of all, what is uh, Orthodox Marxism? Uh, look at, this is one of the most notorious passages in all of uh, Lukacs' uh, work. Uh, Lukacs points out that being an Orthodox Marxist means adherence to method and not results. We can read this particular part. Let us assume for the sake of the argument that recent research has disproved once and for all every one of Marx's individual theses. Even if this were to be proved, every serious orthodox Marxist would still be able to accept all such modern findings without reservation and hence dismiss all of Marx's theses in toto without having to renounce his orthodoxy for a single moment. So in that sense, being an orthodox Marxist means adhering to a method. But there is a second part as well that is often overlooked in this debate that being an Orthodox Marxist means understanding materialist dialectic as a revolutionary dialectic, means understanding Marxism not as a contemplative, uh, not as a speculative philosophy, but instead as the process of building a unity between theory and praxis. And this unity is expressed in the emergence of consciousness, which takes a decisive step and brings consciousness brings thought closer to the historical process. In that sense, being a historical Marxist beyond method also means uh, fostering the development of class consciousness. And this is really important because this is one of the key ideas of Lukacs in general, that Orthodox Marxism has to understand the importance of the subjective factor. Lukacs has lived, as Constantine uh, really greatly demonstrated, Lukacs lived through the First World War changed his views, uh, was shocked uh, by the Russian Revolution, and in a sense understood this meme, that materialism time and again, just like uh, Barney from The Simpsons, will have to face the question of subjectivity. And it's not, not just about compromising with the idea of subjectivity, but building a dialectical system that has inherently incorporated the idea of subjectivity. Of course, Lukacs will turn to this idea once again on his book on Lenin. And I think his most brilliant moment on this subject is on the, the book on Tales and the concept of the Augenblick. But at this point, it's important that Orthodox Marxist means understanding the importance of the subjective factor and of course, the working class, as we will see later on. What, what's, who, who's our enemy? Who's the enemy of uh, Orthodox Marxist to speak in that terms? First of all, Bernstein and Second International, Bernstein is the first to clearly state that materialism and dialectics don't go well together. And Lukacs, and this is important in his era because, uh, let's open a, a small parenthesis, even after the rupture between Second and Third International, the philosophy of the Second International, the books by Kautsky and Bernstein are still considered orthodox Marxists while the writers seem to diverge and become right-wing opportunists, their books themselves are still considered to be orthodox Marxists. And this is what Lukacs is trying to demonstrate. 
It's not just about that Bernstein made political errors in judgment. It's that his understanding of Marxism is fundamentally flawed because he wants to divorce materialism from dialectic. So first of all, this is a crucial enemy. At the same time, Lukacs doesn't stop there. He says that there is a, a clear philosophical, theoretical thread between Bernstein and, uh, and bourgeois thought. Which, what is that? Their obsession with facts. Their belief that facts in and of themselves can tell us things about the, the reality in which we live. And look at, this is another uh, notorious passage, a situation in which the facts speak out unmistakably for or against the definite course of action has never existed and neither can or will exist. Facts by itself, by themselves, mean nothing. When do facts matter? That's the next point. Facts matter when they are mediated, when they are entered within a, an understanding of society as a whole, and when they are understood within a process of interaction. So in that sense, facts, material, doesn't matter, data, don't mean anything unless they are understood dialectically. Of course, that's the, the next point. What does dialectical interaction mean? As Lucas says, interaction by itself is a cliche. Everything interacts with everything else. That doesn't mean anything in particular, not, not, in, not in philosophy, neither in, in Marxism. What's important is the dialectical relation between subject and object within a historical process, as Constantine mentioned earlier. And this is a dialectical relation because the object itself is transformed. So in that sense, we need, we need to understand dialect, dialectical relations with both, uh, both poles, both, both factors are transformed through this process. This is one of the first uh, uh, critiques against Engels by Lukacs, uh, because what he wants to point out, and we will discuss this later on, is that the dialectics of nature and dialectics and society are fundamentally different. And in that sense, he wants to emphasize that the book of uh, the book of Engels on uh, dialectic of nature is uh, fundamentally flawed in that part, at least. Uh, we should also be mindful of the time. Hmm. So this dialectical interaction is uh, always situated within a historic process, is always and is always part of a totality. To understand totality, Lukacs has to go back back to Marx and state that the relations of production of every society form a whole. And in that sense, the apparent independence of facts, data, and everything else is an illusion. Moreover, Lukacs wants to make clear that in order to understand isolated facts, we need to understand them as a part of the whole and understand them, in order to understand them meaningfully, we understand how they change when the whole, when the totality changes. And in that sense, we are now at a point that we can understand what dialectics, at least for Lukacs at this point, actually means. So this is the whole process of contents in a way. But it's not enough to just speak of dialectics, to speak of totality, to speak of interaction. Once again, we need a subject. We need a historically concrete social subject which embodies this process. And this is where the proletariat comes into the fore and uh, ties everything together. Because the proletariat occupies a particular situation within the capitalist mode of production. It's this particular class which cannot comprehend itself without comprehending the whole of society, without, compre without comprehending society as a totality. From this follows that when, when the proletariat changes itself, when it's developing its class consciousness, when it's engaging in mass action, at the same time, it's transforming the whole of society. And this is the way that Lukacs wants to remain within the Marxist, uh, the, Marxian, the Marxian concept of the capital, but at the same time reintroduces a, a, a notion from the Hegelian philosophy, uh, the identical subject object. Once again, I will have to read the passage. From its own point of view, self-knowledge, its own meaning the proletariat's point of view, self-knowledge coincides with knowledge of the whole, so that the proletariat is, the proletariat is at one and the same time the subject and object of its own knowledge. When proletariat 
transforms itself, transforms uh, consequently the whole of society. And that sense is a potentially revolutionary social subject. Of course, uh, all these ideas didn't go well, didn't fit well either with the with the theoretical standpoint of the Communist International, neither with the unorthodox Marxists of the era. The era. Uh, and it's important to also stress out that point because we have we often come to think that Lukacs and Kors were uh, the main unorthodox Marxists of the era. This is not exactly true. We will try to highlight some points of convergence and some points of divergence. First of all, while Lukacs was trying to build a theory, a philosophical framework for the Third International, course, was adamant that uh, Orthodox Marxists, whether they come from the Kautskian version or from the Third International, have little to no interest in philosophy. And this is also the critique, of course, towards Lenin, saying, so when Kors was stating that Lenin decided philosophical questions only on the basis of non-philosophical consideration and results, meaning the situation and the tasks of the party, Kors at the same time is critical of Lukacs because he cannot accept the, the main goal that Lukacs is posing at this point. So for, for Kors, the second and the third international have a common uh, stance towards philosophy. But at the same time, Lukacs is being criticized from within the Third International. Of course, we know about uh, the comments made by Zinoviev on the uh, fifth conference of the Comitern, but also there is the really well-known text by De Borin stating uh, Georg Lukacs and his criticism of Marxism. There, De Borin starts from the passage that I read earlier on, stating that it's not easy, it's, it's not feasible, in fact, to separate method and results. There is no actual way in which we can state that uh, if all of Marxist theses are refuted by contemporary research, then we can still remain Marxists. Uh, this is the first point of critique uh, pointed towards Lukacs. And then De Boren goes on to state that Lukacs is in fact a dualist, as he's critical of dialectics of nature, he is, in fact, an idealist regarding the matter of nature, and he still believes, Lukacs still believes, that he can remain a dialectical materialist regarding social and historical reality. And in that sense, De Boring is starting to build a point of undermining the whole concept of dialectics that is built in Lukacs. Uh, so, this is a point that uh, is, comes time and again when we're discussing Lukacs, because this is also what David Morley was trying to say, that dialectics of nature is a way to understand uh, the common points that tie into society and nature, to understand nature as a part of society, when Lukacs is stating that these two types of uh, dialectics are fundamentally different, he is in fact creating a Marxist that is unable to deal with questions of uh, ecology, environmental justice, and so on, and so on. Uh, however, I think that at this point, uh, Bellamy Foster is closer to the truth, stating that Lukacs did not exactly reject dialectics of nature, but Lukacs was trying to propose something like a hierarchy of dialectics. And in that sense, Lukacs was more or less trying to, to emphasize the difference between what is going on within nature and the relationship between nature and society, and what's going with, on within the capitalist society, and the way that consciousness is transformed, which is something that does not exist, of course, in nature. So, what I think, uh, uh, let's check out the time, yes, should be making my closing remarks. Uh, so, what I think is most important uh, at this point, I think, first of all, that Lukacs was correct to understand as his opponent empiricism and scientism. And uh, I think that it's also true today in the era of postmodernism, postmodern philosophy, postmodern capitalism, and so on and so on. Lukacs understood that at the core of the bourgeois thought, at the core of the flawed uh, consciousness of large segments of the proletariat, lies an obsession with everyday life, with facts, 
with things that tie us down and they are, un they are unable to be understood unless they are mediated. And in that sense, the concept of totality, I think, retains a revolutionary, a liberatory potential. And I, I think this is uh, one of the most brilliant parts in, on the, uh, within this chapter on Orthodox Marxism. Uh, of course, the whole strict separation between methods and results, I think this passage in itself cannot be defended nowadays. Uh, and I think that Lukacs, the critics uh, pointed towards Lukacs, found a quick and relatively easy way to discredit the whole essay and the whole point that Lukacs is making. I think the most important part about the question regarding method and results is that Marxism itself should be self-reflective, should be able to transform, should be able to, to engage with the new issues, new challenges, and so on. It's not about a separating method from results as much as transforming itself. And I think in that sense, Lukacs makes a convincing case for a self-reflexive Marxist reading of Marxism, which understands its limits as a theory that is born within uh, the capitalist society, uh, its origins, and the ways that it will be transformed in a post-capitalist uh, setting. And uh, I think that in that sense, Lukacs is reuniting himself once again with Kors, because Kors chose to end his book stating that bourgeois consciousness must be philosophically fought by the revolutionary materialist dialectic. This struggle will only end when the whole of existing society and its economic basis have been totally overthrown in practice. And this consciousness has been totally surpassed and abolished in theory. In that sense, Kors concludes, philosophy cannot be abolished without being realized. So this is what also stands for Marxism. And I think Lukacs makes a point for a Marxism that is able to supersede itself or at least significantly alter itself without losing its revolutionary potential. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandros. Uh, this was a very nice presentation of also the context and the debate in which uh, the chapter is inserted. Um, so we'll go now to the uh, questions. We have some questions from the chat. And the first one is from Ralph, and he uh, is asking Constantine that he missed the reference for the 1915 article by Lukács. And he asks, uh, was he suggesting that Marxist aesthetics was underdeveloped? So if you could uh, clarify a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. It's an interesting question, I think, because um, at the time, in uh, during the First World War, um, Lukács is writing on aesthetics, even two versions of it in a short part of one version was even published in 1917-18 in the journal Logos under the title, The Subject-Object uh, Relation in Aesthetics. And I think um, there's a reason why um, in this article I have been quoting from 1915, he does not explicitly talk about the relation between Marxism and aesthetics or only, uh, only um, let's say merely explicitly, um, uh, because uh, at the time, I think he would argue that uh, values within aesthetics cannot be um, su sufficiently understood through Marxism. So he wouldn't even be looking for a, a truly Marxist aesthetics. And it's only later, I think from the 1930s on, that he has the ambition to uh, develop um, specifically Marxist aesthetics. Thanks, Constantine. Uh, now we have this comment uh, for Alexandros. Whether well, uh, Lukacs was right about angles. This is a major theme of Lukacs in dualism in the dialectic and subject object. Uh, what do you think, Alexandros? And then uh, Victor also said he, uh, he would like to chip in um, in, uh, in this discussion. Uh, 
Uh, okay, I, <laughs> as I saw that question, I was looking for the passage uh, from Talism in the dialectic because I think that in Talism, Lukacs, while maintaining his position, he reformulates it in a much better way. I will find it in a few moments. Uh, first of all, Lukacs himself, in the preface of uh, 1967, is highly critical of uh, this uh, particular passage where he says that Engels does not understand dialectics as an interaction between subject and object. And uh, Lukacs, late Lukacs states that, of course, Engels understood this uh, particular form of interaction, and it was clearly uh, unfair of me to imply otherwise. And so Lukacs has in, in, uh, got involved in self-criticism in that part. Uh, I think that the uh, in the core of his argument, Lukacs is right. And I think that this is a point that many Marxists coming from different origins with different understandings of dialectics and philosophy always have a problem of tying the Book of Engels within the larger uh, Marxist narrative. Because the way that nature, uh, that uh, phenomena, phenomena in nature develop and phenomena within social society develop while in an abstract manner, they can't be described to be similar when we engage with them concretely and pose the, the notions like consciousness. I think that uh, there are significant problems there. So in that sense, yeah, I think that uh, this is some, one of the parts of uh, Lukacs' critique of Engels that are uh, really important today. And, oh, sorry, one more point. Uh, while I understand the point made by Morley and other Marxists that Lukacs understand, the Lukacian understanding of nature seems to undermine uh, a movement, an env environmental and or ecological movement, I think that this is not the case. And also, I think it's interesting that the, the renaissance of interest in Lukacs happened exactly within a point of time, within 1960s, 1970s, when the interest within Marxism and within the left for uh, Ecology was at its height. Victor, you want to also uh, speak a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, this is a great question about Engels, and uh, I'll just add to what Alexander uh, stated because the question is does he reject Engels? Does he? Uh, it's clear that there's a criticism of Engels, but which Engels? And that's the question. There's by no means uh, a complete rejection of Engels' thought as a reference uh, prioritizing Marx alone. Uh, Lukács quotes Engels extensively in History and Class Consciousness. So Lukács is very precise about uh, criticizing or rejecting the application of dialectics to nature or to natural phenomena, but with all the caveats that Alexandros uh, raised. So in that respect, he clear, there's clear, clearly criticism and there's also uh, a critique of Engels' concept of dialectics in the sense of uh, dialectics is that which uh, uh, represents the fluidity of concepts rather than uh, the relationship between subject and object. So between the 1919 version of what is orthodox Marxism and the version for HCC, I'll go into that in, in my talk tomorrow, he, uh, he changes the, the manner in which he values uh, the dialectical method and what is a quote a positive reference to angles becomes a criticism of angles because of this emphasis on fluidity interaction as uh, as alexandra uh, stated okay but there's much more to this relationship the intellectual relationship and if you look at what lukacs is quoting in hcc from angles uh, you understand also the points where they are uh, in fact aligned so what is Engels doing? The, the text that Lukacs quotes uh, in HCC, he quotes the uh, Luca, uh, Engels' text on Ludwig Feuerbach in the end of uh, Idealist Philosophy. So where Engels is uh, going back to the 1840s and to the young Marx and his youthful self, and, and in a way bringing back the debate with the young Hegelians as a, as a forgotten but essential source of the materialist conception of history. Uh, and there, the critique of Feuerbach is very central and also the problem of alienation, of course. 
Engels is also editing Capital, especially the later volumes, which Lukács quotes extensively. Um, but what else is Engels doing at this time? He is theorizing pre-capitalist society. So we have uh, the origin of the family and private property. Um, and Lukács is also in HCC very much concerned about the differentiation between modern capitalist society and pre-capitalist society. And this is where he quotes Engels quite extensively and quite favorably. In that regard, uh, Engels is, uh, Lukács finds in Engels the same kind of effort he is attempting, which is to extend Marxist conclusions beyond the critique of political economy to other phenomena. So if Engels is doing this to the family uh, or to military affairs, he is also trying to understand what is the element that uh, explains the generalization of uh, the determinants of the capitalist mode of production, so the commodity form, uh, to other phenomena that are not immediately economic in nature, right? And so uh, I prepared this for another presentation on Lukács, but I just want to show you a few quotes because this, uh, this question of uh, his relationship to Engels is, uh, is one that um, is, I find quite important and where there's a lot of misunderstanding, where there is, a, there is criticism, but by no means a total rejection. Um, let me see, where is the slide? Just a second, because I have the best source for Lukacs's view of Engels in around the time where, uh, at, or at least in this phase, is this short article written in. Uh, it's, I think it's only available in German. Sorry, here it is, uh, on the centenary of uh, Engels's birthday, and the reference is here on the screen, and. There, Lukács says that, uh, there's this beautiful quote where he says, if Marx represented uh, in the question of method, but also the details, the principle of depth, Engels represented breadth, the conquest of the world. Marx represented the principle of the ultimate theoretical clarity, Engels of the uncompromisingly clear practical application. And so because Engels in the 1880s and 90s is also in debate with uh, German social democrats and in debate about, you know, what do you do with the state, uh, reform versus revolution, elections. This is, Lukács finds, again, resources for his own uh, political thought or the political dimension of his thought in history and class consciousness. And he very clearly uh, speaks of both as the source of his thought. So this, there's the second quote here. Uh, which refers to orthodox Marxism. So we could say, to Lukács, there is not only orthodox Marxism, but also orthodox Engelsianism. And what does that mean? Uh, quote, the guardians of bourgeois science and of petty bourgeois socialism will call me a quibbler or Talmudist. When we go back to them, plural, like we go back to the source, we do so to learn the method with them, to know how it is possible to serve the unitary interest of the proletarian revolution under permanently changing circumstances with changing tactics. So in a nutshell, the orthodox Engelsianism is the ability to also respond uh, through the Marxist method to changing political uh, circumstances and situations. And in this, he values Engels very much, his ability to deal uh, with new conditions and situations innovatively, but still remaining true to, um, to a revolutionary perspective. So thank you. Uh, Alexandre, would you like to respond to that? I would, I would like to make some, some additions based on Taylorism. As I said, I think that uh, this is where Lukács formulated his ideas more clearly. Uh, first of all, Lukács quotes a bit uh, from Marx on the interaction between man and nature. And uh, the, in the final quote, uh, the final quote, Marx states that, one second, Marx states that uh, as soon as the first animal state seizes, property of the human is mediated to nature through his existence as a member of a community, family, tribe, through a relation to other people that determines the relation to nature. So Lukács then comments on this point, on these passages from Marx, stating that I believe that these passages speak loud and clear. 
to see nothing more than that which the fundamental sentence of historical materialism says. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. And Lukacs continues stating that our consciousness of nature, in other words, in other words, our knowledge of nature is determined by our social being. So I think uh, this is the most clear reformulation that Lukacs attempts. He's not denying that there is a dialectical process within nature and that our understanding of nature is also dialectic, is also historical. Uh, but he wants, and this is also tied to the notion of higher and lower levels of dialectics, that the determining, fa the determining factor here is the relationships, the social relations, and they determine our understanding of nature, which I also think is pertinent to what uh, uh, Victor said about the, the difference between, a uh, radical difference between pre-capitalist and capitalist modes of production and their relation to nature. Okay, thank you, Alexandros. So we have uh, three more questions for Alexandros in the chat, and Victor also wanted to pose a question to Constantine. I propose to ask one of the questions to Alexandros now because it's tied to the same topic, and then we go to Victor's question to Constantine. So the question uh, to Alexandros is from Eden, our fellow marathoner, and. Uh, Yes, I wonder if Alexandros could talk a little bit more about Foster's interpretation of Lukács' uh, hierarchy of dialectics. I wonder if hierarchies are an undialectical application of dialectics. And also, sorry, there are two questions um, uh, in the same topic. The second one is from Capelle Hotter. Lukács' view on the dialectic of nature in HCC is often opposed to his later approach during the 60s. What do you think about that? Okay, on the first uh, subject on hierarchy of dialectics, and uh, I will quote once again a passage from uh, Thales, because I think uh, that's where Lukács really clears things up. There, there is a section titled Simple and Higher Categories of Dialectic. Among the simple categories, uh, Lukács speaks about nature and the pre-capitalist modes of production and the interaction between man and nature within these contexts. And of course, speaking about higher categories of dialectic, Lukács always uh, has in mind art and aesthetics. And this is also what he references here. And uh, so in that, in that sense, I think that Lukacs distinguishes between different categories of the dialectic based on uh, questions of autonomy and degrees of, of autonomy. As uh, the subject has a greater degree of autonomy within the context of art and aesthetics, Lukacs appoints to this uh, field a higher degree of, uh, calls it a higher degree of dialectic, higher category of the dialectic. To be honest, I'm not so sure if that is a and dialectical notion, but uh, I think that what it uh, retains is the notion of Lukacs that uh, the subjective factor, the conscious interaction between a uh, subject and object is what distinguishes between different forms of, uh, between different categories of the dialectic, between different historic eras, and between uh, the proletariat and other social classes. And in that sense, I think it's a consistent way of uh, understanding what uh, materialist dialectics mean. And uh, regarding the other question on uh, his later approach, hmm, I think that uh, this question is mainly referring to the, the first volume uh, on, on the ontology, where Lukacs engages with the question of labor. Uh, I think... <laughs> I think that there is a shift in focus because in the first volume of the ontology, Lukacs tries, Lukacs goes back to Engels and his, his book on the evolution of man, and he tries to build a link between labor, nature, uh, language, and communication. And I, I think that in, in that sense, Lukacs is trying to reintegrate uh, 
nature and laboring within nature within his system. So yeah, maybe we, we should speak of a shift within the Lukasian system. Still, of course, uh, within the ontology and the way that the, these volumes are, are organized, I think that the notion of higher and simple categories of the dialectic is also maintained. I mean, look at the splitting of labor in pre-capitalist societies and clearly distinguishes it from labor within capitalism. And the way that communication, language, and consciousness is developed is clearly different within these two contexts. Many thanks, Alexander. So, Victor, do you want to pose your question to Constantine? Sure. Uh, bef before I, I uh, ask Constantine something, just to add something to what Alexandra said regarding the question of the difference to the later work. So just very briefly, one element where there's a clear difference is that in history and class consciousness, the fundamental uh, category from which Lukács departs is praxis. Um, social praxis as the also fundamental category to understand ideological phenomena, reification, to break through it, etc. In the ontology, it's, there's very clearly a shift to the category of labor. And uh, in following uh, Marx and Capital in chapter five, as labor is the element of mediation uh, between uh, man and nature, this is what opens up the perspective for uh, a di dialectical integration of, of nature into the, his later perspective. So again, is, if this is a qualitative uh, shift we can debate, but this is a clear difference. What is the fundamental category from praxis to labor um, and to the labor process? On the other hand, if we read, uh, rereading uh, history and class consciousness, I was, I was surprised to find many references to social being, uh, so if there's not an ontological uh, question in history and class consciousness, my, uh, my Adornian uh, friends will, uh, will remind me of that. That's not necessarily an ontological position, but Lukács very clearly speaks about uh, a reality of, of the way things manifest or their appearance, their reified objectivity, and the effective so social or societal being uh, that is behind them. So there is an opening for an ontological perspective in history and class consciousness, and so this is a point that already raises the questions that he will uh, go back to in his later work. And of course, while he's writing the ontology, that's, that's the moment that he went back to history and class consciousness and wrote his uh, preface to it. So um, it's, it's interesting to think if the questions raised there were also in somehow, in some way responded in the, in the manuscript of the ontology and the ethics that he didn't publish. So, but these are just a few uh, a few elements to for us to think. Uh, my question to Constantine is: uh, I was also struck by the fact that the the differentiation between absolute and ob objective spirit, taken directly from Hegel, uh, is abandoned by Lukács. So it, he uses that. That's very central to his argument in 1919. But he distances himself from these categories. And in HCC, absolute spirit makes only one appearance and under uh, quotation marks, he, this is not, no longer central to his thinking. And if the abandoning this differentiation is precisely what opens up space uh, for the category of reification or for the critique of reification of how, uh, the critique of how things manifest themselves, present themselves, their objectivity under capitalism uh, with regards to this social being to the effective core of reality. If this is what allows uh, the critique of reification or, or creates the fact that he transcends these categories open up the demand for this new conceptualization. So that's my question to Constantine. Uh, thank you, Victor. I, I, I take this question as a note that my presentation might have made this uh, impression or this might have made it appear as if um, this was the case. But of course, uh, one would have to stand this on its feet. Um, the truth doesn't come from the books, but from reality. And in this case, um, I think um, one could argue that the, um, 
political um, developments and events, the repeated attempts of, of uprisings and revolutions which um, repeatedly fail and do not succeed um, would be the um, primary <laughs> cause uh, for Lukács to change his theory and um, also to take into account different effects of the way of organizing um, social life uh, um, in which he describes the, um, the phenomenon of reification. So it's rather the necess necessity to take into account what he calls reification that um, makes possible, I think, to um, push back maybe <laughs> Um, the uh, the stance of uh, the concept of absolute spirit, but at the same time, I would not say that uh, he's, he's ab abandoning it, abandoning it uh, completely, because uh, even in the in the later writings, he's uh, trying to dif differentiate, and I think this uh, also could be applied uh, to what um, Alexander has uh, said about uh, different uh, maybe uh, spheres of dialectics, um, uh, yeah, so um, I think also the, the Valeta Lukács will in a certain sense uh, uh, speak of uh, absolute uh, spirit, but um, in a very different sense than uh, in the early 1920s. Okay, thank you, Konstantin. So now we go to uh, the other question to Alexandros uh, from Dimitra, also a fellow marathoner. And she asks, Alexandros, could you say some words about the break taking place between Lukács' essay, What is Orthodox Marxism and Bolshevism as a moral problem that you referred to in your presentation? Okay, I think it's uh, pretty clear because uh, when Lukács writes uh, Bolshevism as a moral problem, he finds the uh, Russian Revolution as extremely interesting, but uh, mainly he understands it on uh, moral grounds. And he doesn't have the ambition to build the whole the theoretical system that supports the Russian Revolution, that poses questions based on its actions and so on. For example, for Lukács, uh, taking hostages, which one of the actions of the Bolshevik party, uh, to counter the white terrorism. For Lukács, uh, this, is a, this is an act that undermines the whole revolutionary and liberatory potential of the revolution. Uh, now, Lukács does not exactly uh, push out the questions of ethics completely, because in the meantime, he's written a book on tactics and ethics, and he, he always comes back to said questions. But now, uh, he recognizes the importance of the Russian Revolution and he has, I think, two, two main goals. He doesn't want to judge it on moral grounds, but he wants to give a, a philosophical justification to the, to the revolution. And at the same time, he wants to, to pose the question, why wasn't the revolution successful in the advanced uh, capitalist countries of the West? And this ties into the whole debate about the uh, verification, uh, the importance of Taylorism, uh, the, the way the factory is organized and for, forms the consciousness of the proletariat. So I think at this point we are talking about two completely different uh, set of, sets of questions. And of course, the, the defining moment, as Constantine said, is that Lukács is now part, integral part of the communist movement. Himself is leading a revolution when he starts writing. And in that sense, I think it's a completely different uh, way of addressing the question of Bolshevism. Thank you, Alexandros. Uh, we have one last question. Um, Robin Chang asks, can you comment on Andrew Finbeck and his book on praxis? Um, we were talking here uh, and apparently Constantine is the one that has already read the book or part of it and could comment on it, maybe? Uh, well, I'm afraid I'm not prepared to 
give a final evaluation of the book. But um, I think one, one very important aspect of the argument is that um, Feenberg emphasizes reification not to be only a phenomenon of consciousness, but it is a way of organizing, organizing society, a way of um, mediating relations between people through things. Uh, and this, I think, has very important um, consequences for uh, the strategies how to deal with reification and its uh, effects and its consequences. And um, uh, maybe this is where um, in Feinberg's uh, concept of praxis, uh, mm, the crucial point comes in that, um, well, um, Also, the um, let's say tendencies within the organization of our society, and so to speak, within the things, have to be taken into account um, because they represent, uh, if, if I may be so bold to say, to put it like that, um, represent the way uh, of the organization of the society. But um, yeah, I think it's. Um, It is a very important contribution to the, to the discussion because uh, most of the times, um, most of the time, um, reification uh, is understood rather as a pro problem of, of consciousness and um, uh, appears to be uh, um, solvable. solvable only through uh, taking a different perspective or something like that. Thank you so much, Constantine. So we do have time for one more question and Giovanni Zanotti, who is also part of the marathon, uh, just uh, wrote a, a comment uh, actually to Victor. And I think uh, it, it's about this relation with the ontology and that's something that uh, will probably come up again in the discussion. Uh, in the next few days um, and also shows the diversity within uh, the marathoners themselves. So uh, uh, Giovanni's comment is, Victor, I think the main problem with ontology from a historian class consciousness perspective is that it seems to be incompatible with the radically self-reflective idea of a subject mediated by part of the subject. Um, do you want to uh, comment, Victor? Uh, it's good. It's good to see that uh, Giovanni is watching us. But well, I need to think about it uh, also because we'd have to make some kind of reference to the chapter on ideology in in the ontology uh, that it has no self reflect that it fails at self reflection to the to the degree that uh, history and class consciousness uh, you know encompasses that. I don't know. Uh, I think I'll <laughs> I'll leave that for uh, for our final debate to give a proper response uh, but so I guess I'm just going to close this the session now Mariana uh, yes uh, trying to escape from a very difficult question uh, from a dear friend we will uh, continue in an hour so thanks first of all very much to uh, Constantine and to Alexandros for their uh, presentations and to Mariana for, for hosting and thanks to Paul to uh, who's behind the scenes making the, all of this possible. Uh, just want to make a, a final thanks. This, this marathon was uh, postponed uh, because of a, a, an emergency situation uh, in my family. And I just want to thank everyone in the, in the, who's participating, who were kind enough to change all their schedules so that we could um, do this two weeks later. So just uh, a thank you there. We will see you in an hour, uh, more or less to hear Ankitsa Chakardic speaking about essay number two on Rosa Luxemburg's uh, Marxism and Eden on consciousness with Constantine's um, message in mind that we're not dealing here only with intellectual development uh, with a conceptual discussion but also with someone who is uh, evolving as a thinker precisely through his ins concrete insertion in the movement and all uh, in responding to all his that is around him 
uh, in that historical moment. So thank you very much, and uh, we will see you in an hour in, at the same place for the continuation of the marathon. So thanks, everybody, for your questions, and see you soon.